Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Calgary Public Library and Discovery House Family Violence Prevention Society, I want to thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Brittany Beatty. I'm the Director of Community Relations at Discovery House, and I will be moderating today's panel. Before we begin, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the land we are on. We honor and acknowledge the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Sitsika, the North and South Pigani Nations, the Ganai Tribe, and other members of the Treaty 7 First Nations, the Sutsina Nation, and the three bands of the Yahie Nakoda Nations, Chiniki, Wesley, and Bears Paw. The city of Calgary, known as Mokinsis to the Blackfoot, is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Finally, we acknowledge all nations, Indigenous and non, who live, work, and play on this land and who honor and celebrate this territory. So before we begin, I just want to let you know that if you're having any technical issues, you can pop those challenges in the chat and someone can help you, or you can call 403-260-2600 and someone from the Calgary Public Library will be able to help you with that. The topic this afternoon is domestic violence, the shadow pandemic. And we're here to have a robust discussion on domestic violence in Calgary and Alberta. There have been many conversations around the impact of COVID-19 on the rates of domestic violence, and we hope today to delve a little deeper into those numbers. We will also discuss today how the civil and public sectors have risen to the challenge of responding to domestic violence during the pandemic. We're extremely fortunate uh, to be joined by some very distinguished panelists and I uh, first wanted to introduce the Honorable Rajan Sani, who is the Minister of Community and Social Services. Uh, we're so grateful that you were able to take the time to join the call today. Um, I'm going to introduce each of the panelists and um, they will briefly introduce themselves and a little bit of background, a little bit about their background in the sector. So, um, uh, Minister Sani, would you like to join us first? Hi, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm also very grateful to be here on behalf of the government of Alberta. And I can tell you that yesterday I was on several panels celebrating International Women's Day and uh, it was quite, um, quite revealing as to how often this topic came up. I mean, International Women's Day was all about uh, celebrating the successes and accomplishments of women. But I mean, ultimately we all know that as far as we've come, we still have a long ways to go. And what this pandemic has revealed and really shed um, light on is that the issues of domestic violence have been exacerbated as a result of this pandemic. So um, we had some very, very fulsome conversations. And as you know, as your minister for um, Alberta for Community and Social Services, my ministry deals with uh, funding women's shelters and sexual assault centers and also we are also talking more and more about policy options around what we can do as government to make sure that we're combating these rates to the best of our ability but it's not just government alone it's it's all of our community partners um, we talk about civil society and we talk about the private sector not-for-profits and and other organizations that can come together to really help us define solutions and, and other policies that we can put in place to make sure that we truly are making a dent. So that is what I'm doing um, as the MLA for Calgary Northeast. I can also tell you that some of the stories that I'm hearing from the ethno-cultural communities are heartbreaking. Um, people are at home, they're working virtually, families are together and the pressure has been mounting um, as a result of the public health measures and the pandemic itself. And so we're seeing increased rates, as we all know. Um, I'm hearing the stories every day of increased rates of family violence. So this is a very important uh, panel for me to be a participant at because I do want to talk about what we're doing from the perspective of government. And I also want to hear what everybody else is doing as well, my community partners. So thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm sorry, I think I, it's Brittany, right? Yeah. Thank you. That's right. Thank you so much, Minister Sani. 
Um, we'll introduce the rest of the panelists now. Um, Minister Sonning, feel free to uh, leave your camera on as everyone else joins us. Um, yeah. Constable Sunderland, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, yes, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this. I'm a constable with Calgary Police for 15 years now. <clears throat> and currently I'm working over in Four District, which is Southeast Calgary, uh, Forest Lawn, Marble Area, Aaronwood. Great, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Kim Roos. Hi, uh, so I'm Kim Roos and I have the honor of being the, co the co-chair of the Calgary Domestic Violence Collective, which is a collective of over 70 agencies in Calgary, all focused on ending family violence and abuse in Calgary and area. And I also am currently the CEO of the Calgary Women's Emergency Shelter here in Calgary, which is um, an organization that runs a 50 bed emergency shelter as well as um, we serve over 15,000 uh, Calgarians, men, women, and children uh, in, and families in Calgary through outreach, resources, uh, support, counseling groups and schools, and a crisis line as well in and around Calgary and area. So thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this panel. I'm very honored to be a part of this group today. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Leslie Hill. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Leslie Hill and I'm the Executive Director at Discovery House. Um, I'm so pleased to be a part of this panel and to have this uh, amazing group of speakers join us today. Discovery House provides a continuum of care to women and their children who are leaving domestic violence. We provide um, safe transitional housing and client-centered supportive programs for six months or more through a second stage, stage shelter, which bridges the gap between emergency shelters and long-term housing and also in our community housing program. Our programs offer women and their children the support, counseling and time that they need to begin healing from the physical and psychological trauma associated with domestic violence. And last but certainly not least, uh, Stephanie, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Wright and I am the provincial manager of 211 Alberta. 211 uh, connects all Albertans to the information and resources, uh, uh, a full range of community, government, social and health supports. Um, and we now, as of last uh, July, we uh, ramped up our, our launch province-wide, uh, thanks uh, to, to the support of the government of Alberta. Um, we operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and Albertans can reach us by phone, text, or online chat services, uh, as well as um, on uh, if you phone into 211, you can um, access our services in over 170 languages. As well, um, for those of you who might not know, the Family Violence Information Line is actually answered by 211 staff. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That's great information to have. And, and thank you all for taking the time to join us today. I know I am very excited to learn from each of you and, and your expertise and experience. So um, let's launch right into our discussion. And my first question is to you, Minister Sani. During the COVID-19 pandemic, why is domestic violence called the shadow pandemic? Okay. Hey. Thank you. And you know what? We've been hearing this term shadow pandemic for some time. And I've also heard it termed as the echo pandemic. And so what happened um, last May in May of 2020, the United Nations, they had launched a public awareness campaign to show that rates of domestic violence have intensified worldwide as a result of the pandemic. And that's when it was first termed as a shadow pandemic. And we know that the lockdowns have had a disproportionate impact on women because we are seeing these increased rates in domestic violence. And like I said, this is all based, this is all based on international data as well. I think we also know that a lot of abuse occurs behind closed doors. And certainly um, in the early days of the lockdown, women just were not able to access their natural supports in the way that they used to before. And what that meant was a lot of this abuse just wasn't being reported as well. It just wasn't out there in the public domain in any way so that we could uh, get supports out. And the delivery of those supports, that was also challenging because of the level of uncertainty um, at the onset of the pandemic. 
So essentially it's the shadow pandemic because it's not in the light, right? There's so much um, stigma still attached to it. And I had mentioned ethno-cultural communities and I'll bring that up because I have grown up in a community where people didn't talk about domestic violence. It was very much something that was a matter of pride, respect and honor. So when we say shadow pandemic, I see it from that perspective too, that as much as we've come forward in reducing stigma in certain communities, it's going to remain in the shadows for a long time. And that is the challenge that I pose to my community partners is how do we reach out to some of these more marginalized communities and make sure that these conversations are happening and community leaders are engaged to, to talk about um, how we can put culturally appropriate supports together. So thank you. Thank you. And Minister Sani touched on um, some of the international statistics. Stephanie, I'm wondering if you can speak to um, what the statistics look like here in Alberta. What is 211 seeing? Hmm. So um, I think to uh, Mr. Minister Sahani's point, it is a bit of a shadow pandemic um, because I think we all expected to see uh, increased numbers and that didn't always um, come to fruition on the phone lines. For 211 overall, we actually saw a decrease in uh, domestic violence related calls over the last year. However, and so it was about a decrease of about 28%. However, what we did see was um, through June through August, we did see actually a spike and an increase of 19% um, in overall domestic violence related calls. And then also just to bring in um, the family violence information line and stats from there as, as two and one staff answer that as well. We actually did see a bit of an increase on the family violence information line, about a 10% increase in calls, but um, there was a significant um, noted increase in April and May last year, a 50% increase in the calls we would normally see on the family violence information line. Um, so so the, the numbers certainly bear out um, that there are times when people are reaching out, but um, I don't think our numbers tell the whole story. And I think Leslie's going to be able to tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, Leslie, do you want to speak to that a little bit about um, how we, um, across the domestic violence sector, we kind of prepared for an increase in demand and services, but um, but some domestic violence shelters have kind of experienced the opposite. Do you wanna to speak to that a little bit? <clears throat> Absolutely. At Discovery House, our programs are still full um, and, we're, and we're hearing from shelters across the province that that's the case, but we are also learning that there are way more barriers for people who are experiencing domestic violence. Under normal circumstances, people have the ability to reach out to organizations like ours and, and Calgary Women's Emergency Shelter, as well as the crisis lines when their abusers absent, when they go out to go grocery shopping or go to work. And many of the safety nets that exist have also been impacted. Often the first person to notice something's wrong is a teacher, a coworker, a family member or a friend, and with the isolation measures in place that are so essential to combat COVID-19, um, many people are now trapped in their homes with their abusers, and, and domestic violence thrives off of isolation and can create environments where it's not safe for people experiencing violence to speak about it or to ask for help. Um, one of the other things that we're experiencing is that when people have the ability to reach out, the severity of violence is, is more, um, more acute than it, than it normally is. And we're kind of bracing ourselves for the possibility that there, there could be a flood of calls when, you know, when we come back to, to whatever our new normal is when people have their vaccines and when isolation measures are lifted. Um, and we expect that domestic violence services will be needed even more in the coming, coming months. Thanks, Leslie. Um, and, and I know that this isn't um, unique. It's certainly exasperated by the COVID-19 pandemic, but um, according to Statistics Canada, approximately 65% of people who experience domestic violence never access um, shelters or police um, in normal times. And um, Kim, do you wanna speak a little bit to that and, and why that might be the case? Sure. Um, so the minister alluded to the shadow pandemic and the stigma that um, surrounds this issue. 
and um, and this is uh, true in normal times as well as pandemic times. And also, I would add that the issue of family violence and abuse and domestic violence is a really broad term. And so when we hear that term, we sometimes think of it as the physical violence, but it actually includes things like uh, sexual violence, financial abuse, emotional abuse, force of control. There's a lot of things that fall into that category. And so often what happens is people will reach out to friends and family first. And so informal supporters, um, friends and, and colleagues, uh, people in the community are where people will reach out for help first. And so often um, it's even hard to make that first phone call or reach out to a, a, you know, a colleague first. So by the time people reach out to a shelter or a helpline, things are really bad. And so it's, um, it really does take a lot for people to reach out to a formal support. So there's a whole lot of things that happen up until that point. So that stat makes perfect sense to me that there are a lot of people that are experiencing a lot of difficult challenges and a lot of uh, family violence and abuse before they ever reach out to that point. Um, so I think that um, it's, it's perfectly makes sense to me that that's what happens, which is why the community support is so vital and so important and that it is very important that we all understand as Albertans, what does this look like in our community and how we can be great supporters and colleagues and friends and be, um, be helping people have a successful help seeking journey that isn't just about those formal supporters, right? So we all have a role to play in this. And while, um, you know, our resources and supports are very important, I really, it resonated with me what the minister said at the very beginning of this call, that it isn't just about our community agencies and our nonprofits, it's about all of us together working on this issue um, and bringing it to light in ways that are respectful of all of us, but also encouraging us all to reach out for help and, and being that positive support and light for each other so that we're, we're working on this issue together. Thank you very much. And I think that um, it's a really good segue, a really good introduction. Um, Leslie, I'm gonna come back to you. Um, when we're talking about ways that everyone can get involved and everyone can help, can you talk about some ways uh, to recognize domestic violence and, and how people can help? Absolutely. Like Kim said, some of the signs of violence are really overt. Um, they're, you know, Physical violence is, is things like hitting and kicking and, and there might be bruises and that type of thing. But a lot of the signs are actually um, a lot more subtle and they can be things like um, being forced into isolation and confinement in your home, having limited access to resources, finances, um, being prevented from working. Um, you know, emotional and psychological abuse can look like your partner making fun of you, um, calling you names threatening to hurt or kill you or threatening suicide or to take the children if you leave. There's, there's a lot of signs of domestic violence that, are, that can be a little bit more subtle that, that might not be as, as um, recognizable to people who are wanting to support a family member or a friend. Um, the warning signs that we would look for normally in normal times are people withdrawing from family and friends not going out or doing activities that they used to enjoy, um, spending time, like having, having changes in personality like mood swings or anxiety and depression. Um, and some of this stuff might be a lot more subtle and you might not have the opportunity to notice it the same way during the pandemic. Um, but you know, things that you might notice are um, people canceling Zoom calls or not being willing to turn their camera on because they might have a bruise or something like that or that their, that their um, conversation changes because their partners are always in the room. So they're not as open with you as they normally would be. And those are some of the things that you might notice that are different, um, but noticeable signs of domestic violence during the pandemic. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I wanted to come back to some of the conversation around statistics and, um, Constable Sunderland, I understand that um, last year from January to September 2020, the Calgary Police Service um, saw about a 9% increase in domestic incidents um, and that CPS responded to over 15,000 calls um, for domestic incidents. Um, in those situations, what role does the CPS play and how, um, what happens to the perpetrators in those situations? Well, it it really depends on the situation. Um, 
not every perpetrator or person that we come to deal with ends up with charges. Um, the statistics can vary from city to city. I know that Edmonton or the RCMP take their statistics a little bit differently than Calgary. Um, so when we show up to a call, it depends on what is what has happened there because we'll get a call from anything like I was thinking about one last week, um, listening to Leslie and Kim talk about how um, victims will often reach out to their friends and family first. Um, we got a call uh, from a from a cousin of the victim saying that she would like to move out. Um, that she no longer feels safe with her current boyfriend. So we showed up there. No criminal acts had been, you know, alleged even. Um, we stayed there for about an hour and uh, we stood by. Well, she moved all of her stuff that she needed out of her house. Um, and there was no threats. There was no assault. We didn't charge um the person who is, I guess, the offender, the, the threatening party, had a long conversation with him too about his life choices and how he could um, access some counseling in order to make it a little bit better for him. Um, but those all get captured within our reporting system. If we show up, even to that event, we will write a report about it, um, regardless of the fact that we didn't take any actual police action. It was more like a more maybe of a social worker type visit, but because of the potential for violence um, and because we work 24 seven, we definitely go to those. Uh, if we do have somebody that we need uh, to charge, uh, we will take them up to the rush processing center. They will see a justice of the peace and uh, who will then assess whatever um, conditions are necessary, which is usually a no contact with the victim and a no go to their residence or their employment. And then uh, the files will proceed through to court. Um, less serious incidents may end up in early court resolutions, such as uh, a peace bond, which um, ends up with uh, no criminal history. Uh, they will always have that history with us. And, um, or if convicted of an offense, they may end up with uh, jail time and then on probation. Thank you, Constable Sunderland. Um, one of the things that he touched on um, was, was the role, kind of a, that call was a social work call. And Kim, what, what are your thoughts about the role that agencies play and, and the intersectionality of agencies and how those actually improve the response to domestic violence during the pandemic? So I'm gonna switch your question up on you a little bit. Um, Please, go ahead. Cause I, uh, cause I actually think that what, you're, what the question is trying to get at is a continuum of care. And because agencies actually don't have intersectionality because agencies are like, they have structures, they have, um, but, but our job in agencies is to make sure that we are working well to consider the intersectionality. Um, and I think it is, the onus is on us as professionals to make sure that we are considering all of that um, and that we are working to build uh, really great integrated smart partnerships um, that, uh, and we're leveraging our resources in the best way possible to do the best work we can for the clients that we serve. And my, my measure is always, are these services good enough for my friends, my family, my daughters, my mother, my sister, my colleague? That's my, that's my benchmark. And, um, and I think in the pandemic, there were lots of great examples of uh, creativity and innovation in our province um, and people pivoted really quickly. And uh, so Impact did a, a great job of learning on the ground, sharing, like they were so fast. Um, and I'll give great kudos to Andrea Silverstone on that one because they were so fast in taking what agencies were doing well and leveraging that and sharing it quickly so that people could um, you know, share the PPE quickly and the learning from AHS and make sure that we were assertively outreaching to marginalized communities that were, um, uh, were not able to reach out for help when they were um, you know, under the new protection measures, not able to get out and get the help that they needed. And, um, and CDBC was quick as well to make sure that we were um, pivoting and making sure that things were moved digitally really quickly and that 
um, communities and families were able to, um, to get access to uh, technology and things that they needed to get to the services that they needed. Um, you know, there was also the, uh, we, we fast tracked the development of the YYC shelter app, right? So that the emergency beds on shelter, you can actually look on, like we can look online and instead of making a million phone calls, we, we actually can now look and see which emergency shelters have beds. And we want to scale that so that actually the police can be able to look at that. And so that's coming. So there were lots of these pieces that, um, that moved uh, really quickly um, that were, I think, the pandemic sort of spurred it on and made it um, made it possible for agencies to partner really well. And so, as much as the pandemic was a challenge, and um, it it did provide a lot of, um, I guess, um, fuel for the innovation fire uh, in Alberta. And so, um, I think agencies did, uh, you know, it was there was a lot of pressure, but there were lots of examples of ways that they partnered quickly, they moved fast. And, uh, and really did, I think, a, a pretty phenomenal job in really tough situations to make sure that people were safe. And they were assertively and aggressively even outreaching into marginalized communities to make sure that we were, we were getting out there where we could. Um, I think that there are always gaps, like it's, it's, a, it's a really challenging issue because of the stigma in this issue area and because of the, um, the always tenuous uh, dynamics around family violence and abuse and the power that is um, always present in this. And so I think we have to be ever vigilant and always working together and always challenging ourselves to be working better for um, our clients and being putting your egos aside and being focused on what is the mandate, what is the focus of our clients. And so I think um, that's just something you always have to keep in front of your, your head. But I think um, that, yeah, does that answer the question? Is that, I could probably, I can go on forever about all the innovations. I think the, the sector worked really hard. I think we were in a little bit of shock at the beginning of it. But uh, I think uh, great thanks to, to Impact and CDBC for the mobilizers and the, the people that really you know, stepped up and moved quickly and, and the sharing of the PPE. Um, I think the, the fast moving uh, funds, the emergency funds that the government of Alberta and United Way were able to mobilize to help us get out on the ground and try and be ahead of it as well. Um, and then moving the, um, moving the programs into a digital space when schools were closed as well because the kids were also at risk. And so there was a lot of there were a lot of moving pieces and our sector, I think, really stepped up at shelters, never closed, never missed a day. When some shelters were shut down because of COVID, um, other shelters, like we, we mobilized and we took crisis lines, we moved crisis lines over to other shelters, we took in families, we utilized hotels, um, some shelters, you know, fully moved into hotels. And it was, um, it was a very um, busy, stressful time but it was also a very collaborative time as well. So it's, um, yeah, I think there'll be lots to learn looking back over this last year, once we can sort of breathe, which maybe they'll come soon, but um, yeah, it's been a bit of a crazy year. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you so much, Kim. I, your passion for the sector is really shining through and um, I think you've done a really good job of highlighting um, how important it is to collaborate uh, between all the agencies all the organizations working in the domestic violence sector. So thank you for some of those examples. And Constable Sunderland, do you want to talk a little bit, um, maybe outline how uh, the Calgary Police Service works with the agencies and with the community in general to combat uh, domestic violence? Well, um, we work with Homefront very closely and uh, the social workers uh, there. Um, and they maintain contact with the victim through the court process in order to um, help them kind of navigate that because that can be quite intimidating. And keeping track of it also um, can be a little bit difficult because court dates often are pushed far into the future, especially now. With the courts having been closed, I have court dates for 2023 coming up. Uh, they also uh, provide counseling, in some cases financial assistance. Um, there's a company or an organization called Sleepwell that will assist in high-risk situations with adding security upgrades to a home at no cost. And uh, we also work with uh, child and family services, shelters and various addiction counseling um, where, where it seems appropriate. Um, like Kim was mentioning, there's a wide range of, uh, there's, there's a long continuum, you know, and uh, oftentimes we can see that there's a lot of help needed, 
that's not specifically police. Um, and we work as hard as we can to hand off where there's, we could see that some counseling and some social work and some advice really needs to be given although we can't charge quite yet because we don't have the evidence to do it. So we try really hard to make that handoff and refer them to agencies that, that can help them where our mandate stops. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, Minister Sony, I'm gonna come back to you and, and um, talk about how how do we continue uh, supporting all people experiencing domestic violence as a community, as Albertans? Thank you. I was just uh, reflecting and just thinking about some of the comments that I heard earlier today. And uh, I'm, I don't have a lot of expertise in this area. I don't have a social work background, um, but what I am is a problem solver. So um, that is my background, solving problems. And um, I think there, there, there's a lot of work that we can do. We've already alluded to the innovation and the collaboration. And I do have a Premier's Council on Civil Society and Charities who I have tasked to understanding what the mental health supports are across the province. And that work is just underway to get that environmental scan um, uh, happening as we speak actually. And, uh, and part of that is going to include uh, domestic violence supports that are out there in community. I know what we're doing in government and I can give you the stats, you know, we've got a $51 million budget for women's shelters and we are supporting sexual assault centers as well. Um, Kim had mentioned the emergency supports that we provided uh, financial supports last year and that will continue while we're still in the pandemic to make sure that we are complying with um, the Chief Medical uh, Officer of Health uh, um, requirements around uh, public health. But, you know, I, I think, again, when we get back to the problem solving issue, um, Leslie said it really well that domestic violence thrives on isolation. And I think one of the things that government needs to do, which I'm hoping to do, is to talk more about awareness. And you know, even Leslie, the things that you said, some of the signs of domestic abuse, I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me, like um, the virtual signs, you know, hiding bruises or, you know, moderating your um, discussion when somebody might walk in the room. Like this is, uh, this is uh, information that needs to be more widely shared with the public. So there is, is that information piece. And um, I also have the family community um, uh, supports uh, services as well, FCSS, and they have this incredible provincial wide infrastructure in place. And, and I know that I'll be talking to them about this very topic as well. We have a shadow pandemic and how are you innovating and collaborating? And what are you seeing that we as policymakers are not quite aware of? What can you bring to us so that we can start thinking about it and how to uh, liaise with our partners to actually move that forward? So from the government perspective, that's what I'm doing internally. And um, I, I do also, also Claire's Law, uh, the regulations are in place and will be, uh, they will come into effect in April. So that is preventive and you can't really put a measure sometimes on preventive. We have a number of other government programs and I'm not going to go through them in detail right now, but I would say that uh, we've got our family violence information line 310 1818 and other programs and certainly we're going to add some more information on our government website. But again, I think I'll just conclude by saying that um, it's, it's on our radar. This is a cross ministerial effort. We have to have um, health involved and we have to have children's services involved and uh, the status of cultural multiculturalism and status of women, sorry, the ministry of that, it's a bit of a mouthful. So um, I'm also working on that to make sure that, you know, this conversation is not in isolation or in silos, which I hear sometimes government is guilty of, but that it's actually um, a, a consensus and a commonality amongst all of us in terms of how government needs to move forward. Thank you, Minister. 
And would you mind touching on, you touched on Claire's Law, but would you mind expanding on um, what Claire's Law is and, and why it's so significant for the sector? Yeah, so Claire's Law is, um, is named after um, a victim of domestic violence in the UK and uh, they had implemented laws um, after her death allowing for um, people who have standing, either victims or members of family of the victim to look into the criminal history of somebody that they are involved in, in a romantic relationship. So there was um, extensive consultation done. And I think some members who are here today were part of that consultation process back in 2019. And that's when the act was introduced, um, the Disclosure to Prevent Domestic Violence Act. And we spent some time last fall, um, again, doing stakeholder engagement to try to understand how to operationalize these regulations. We wanted to make sure that they were very reflective of, um, of Alberta's unique experiences. So we had a number of community partners at that table. But essentially, this is what um, Claire's Law will do. It will allow families and individuals to get more information about their romantic partner's criminal history and uh, privacy considerations will be um, paramount. And so there's all kinds of information around that, but it will allow you know, men, women, whoever is impacted to make decisions about their life with this romantic partner with some more information. And again, it will be, it's a, it's a preventative measure. And, um, and I'm very pleased that we were able to bring this act forward and to introduce the regulations in the next month or so. Thank you so much. Constable Sunderland, I would like to come to you and talk a little bit about Claire's Law and, and how uh, the Calgary Police Service anticipates that might affect or impact uh, domestic violence going forward. Well, um, we're really excited to see exactly how this will impact. We're not sure exactly um to see how this will happen exactly or what effect it'll, it'll have exactly um we don't want it to be used as a dating tool um you know to try and check out prospective people that you're going to date um is for those people who suspect uh violent traits in their intimate partner um we've I know amongst me and my coworkers, um, we've informally done something similar to this. So we're all very excited to see this kind of formalized. Um, when we would see somebody who's had a violent episode and we're encouraging that party to end the relationship and you can feel that reticence, you know, um, we've often told them, this isn't the first time this has happened with this person. You know, there, there's a bit of a history here. Um, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, but it's been a difficult balance for us. So I like to see that it's being formalized because part of our oath as an officer is that we're not going to disclose any matter to any person that we come across uh, in our duties, except as we can see that it impacts our duties. So when you see that there's some prevention that's needed, um, it balances with that right to privacy. And so we're just, you know, happy to see that everybody else is recognizing this and this is an important thing. And we're making this accessible to people so that I'm really hoping that more people think about this, you know, if they see those warning signs that uh, different panelists have talked about that they think, huh, maybe there's something that's gone on with this person in the past and we can make an application to, to know if there's something serious there. And it gives us a better forum to, to warn when we know somebody really well and now they have a new intimate partner and they should know what they're getting into. Great, thank you very much. Um, 
So we've talked a little bit about the role that uh, government plays and the role that the sector plays and the role that uh, police play. And uh, Kim, I'd love if you could enlighten us a little bit on the role that Albertans and the general public play um, in ending gender-based violence. Sure. Uh, they play the most important role of all. And uh, so I mentioned earlier that people will go to their informal network first and they do. So 70% of people will go to a friend or family member or colleague first. And we know actually that that first connection that people make with their friend or their family member is so important. So how you respond to someone who's actually disclosing whether they have been abused or that they, have, they fear that they have been abusive will determine the trajectory of their help seeking behavior. So for example, if someone comes to their friend and discloses that they think that their partner is, has been abusive and the response is, oh no, not so-and-so, I've known them for years, how could that be? Then the person that discloses that is less likely to then pursue help. And we're often well-intentioned, um, you know, we, we do wanna support our friend, but we're caught off guard. And so, our role as friends and family members and community members um, is really critical. And so educating ourselves on how to be great social supporters and listeners is the most important role of all. Because if people receive a really supportive social response, they are more likely to then take the next step and seek support. And so our job then as Albertans becomes uh, to learn about how do you recognize what are the signs of abuse, how to respond in a way that encourages people to get help, and then how to connect people to that help that's available. And so we call it recognize, respond, refer. And we know also that social supporters can sometimes get caught in the middle and it's sometimes unsafe. And so there's lots of ways that you can get that information. And so Sages offers a group online called Real Talk. Uh, Calgary Women's Mercy Shelter offers a group uh, called Take a Stand, which is actually offered um, through the Calgary Public Library on a, a format just like this. And they will teach you how to do that really well so that you're supporting someone, whether they've been abused or they might have been abusive, because perpetrators also are looking for help. And so, again, if you take nothing else away from today, recognize, respond, refer. And it's really simple. And so I would encourage you to, to find out, you know, how to do that really well. And so Albertans do have the most important role of all, so. Thanks, Kim. And I, that um, we're almost near the end of our panel portion, but I think that's a really good introduction or um, place to move to Stephanie. And Stephanie, if someone is seeing um, or recognizing signs of domestic violence in someone in their community, or if someone's experiencing them, it themselves and they call uh, 211, uh, what's, what's the process that they go through there? What would that call look like? Yeah, so anytime somebody contacts 211, they're connecting with a real live person, a community resource specialist. So it doesn't matter if you're doing the online chat, a phone call, or text, you're still reaching live people. So that's really important to know because um, especially when you haven't yet had the training um, that Kim has been talking about, it can be really intimidating to um, have to broach the, these concerns or these subjects. So when you reach out to 211, you're gonna reach a real live person and they're gonna have a conversation with you. So they're going to um, learn more about why you're calling and what your most um, important needs are at that time. Uh, and so it's not sort of a checkbox sort of survey. Are you experiencing this? And it's not robotic in that way. It's more about building that rapport and having a conversation. Through the process of that conversation, when we're helping you identify your needs, um, we're also paying attention to safety concerns. And those include uh, domestic violence um, for first and third party callers. So for those experiencing domestic violence, as well as those who are supporting someone who may or they, sus they suspect or are experiencing domestic violence, our safety assessments also take into consideration the risk that there's an offender. And then for each of those safety concerns, we also do other safety concerns like um, for um, uh, isolation for seniors or um, suicidality 
those types of things. So our 211 people are generalists, but for the focus of this conversation, um, when we identify those safety concerns, then we're escalating up to the appropriate response. And then um, if, if no emergent response is needed, we're moving on to the referral piece. And we're not gonna overwhelm people with the list of, oh, you can do this or this or this or this. It's two or three referrals. We don't want to overwhelm folks. They're reaching out and we want to make sure that, to Kim's point, it was a successful uh, interaction so that people feel supported. So we'll offer them two to three referrals based on what they've identified their needs are and how um, they might match certain eligibility or accessibility criteria. Uh, and then after that, we talk about how best to access those resources. So sometimes that's a matter of um, making sure you bring um, your um your for student bringing your student id to a service or um if you have to phone and um ask for some support knowing what information to leave on a voicemail for those when they're reaching out saying you know i suspect that um somebody i love is is in a domestic violence situation we're also um, able to do some light coaching on on how to um support that person and coach that person to calling into getting supports. So um, there's a bit of sort of light coaching that we can provide, but really we're about connecting people to the best resources for them. So to Kim's point, she was talking about some of the courses uh, in Calgary. It might be that we're connecting them to a shelter, whatever makes sense for them. And then on eight to 10% of calls, we're offering a follow-up call. Um, so that means that anywhere from, depending on the situation, it could be within 24 hours we follow up or maybe seven to 10 days from now, we're following up to see, were you able to access those supports? And if so, did you get what you needed? If not, um, what other resources can we better refer you to? What got in your way? How can we, how can we navigate this differently? So um, I think when you're thinking about, I, j I just love the focus on um, the part that everybody has to play. In, in ending gender-based violence and domestic violence, um, because as Kim was talking about, this continuum of service. So it starts with everyday Albertans being able to notice and have that education and awareness to be able to notice that, and then to connect um, their loved ones with the pro proper resources. For two on one, we're sort of at the, we're, we're a little higher, we're a little further along the continuum than everyday Albertans, but we're just at the beginning of that extensive continuum of services and supports for domestic uh, violence. So we're that connector. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for that uh, comprehensive overview of 211 and, and how uh, it can help Albertans um, both uh, experiencing domestic violence or, or maybe uh, supporting those who are. Um, that is the end of our panel. I think we have time for maybe one of the questions that was submitted. Um, so I am going to open up this question to all panelists. Please uh, feel free to answer or give your thoughts. Um, and the question is, is domestic violence a gender issue? Who wants to take the first stab at that? I'll take it, sure. Um, so my answer might be fairly controversial. It's actually, I believe that it is an issue of power and that uh, with it being an issue of power, gender does come into it. And so of course, men often have power, but it is, um, it is an issue of absolutely power dynamics within society. And so gender flows into it and, um, and we see that uh, patriarchy in our society and misogynistic views and so on certainly um, sort of overlay that, but it is not just an issue of gender, it is an issue of power. And we see that all the time in our marginalized groups that we deal with. And I think what we're seeing in our community as well as, as and of course, from my perspective in the work that we do every day and the stats that we're seeing um, is that the violence that we're dealing with at the Calgary Women's Emergency Shelter and we are looking, we have to look at our name as well, is that we are seeing violence against marginalized groups that we're gonna to have to deal with differently. The, and I, the phrase we use in our day-to-day -day work is the face of violence is changing. Um, and so I think it's, uh, I think our community is gonna to have to take a look at the, our, our changing demographics, our changing face of violence and, and have some really tough conversations about how are we addressing the power dynamics in our world. That is not to say that uh, the victims usually are women. 
that a high number of victims are women, but there are also some other victims that are maybe not as considered in the way that we serve, um, serve victims. And we also need to consider that children are one of the main victims groups that sometimes people don't necessarily consider. So that's, that's one perspective on it. Thank you, Kim. Would anyone else like to weigh in? Um, I can I can comment. I think uh, I think Kim said it in a in a very eloquent and articulate fashion. Um, the data does indicate that women are disproportionately impacted. I mean that's irrefutable. But uh, but yes, it is it is all about power and that power differential. And um, you know, but having said that, I would say that men tend not to report as well. Right, so we do tend to hear more from women and men don't because again, it goes back to that whole concept of stigma. But uh, certainly everything that Kim said was, uh, was very on point and I would agree with that. Um, but we, again, the data does show that women do bear the brunt of, of these sorts of issues. Thank you. Um, I would just echo what uh, what the minister said and what Kim said about about power dynamics and about addressing some of the root causes and systemic and structural issues that exist in our society that that perpetuate domestic violence. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on a little bit is about the children, and I think you made a really good point, Kim, that that kids are disproportionately affected by violence. In Canada, um, an average of three hundred and sixty two thousand children witness or experience family violence annually. And these children are not only at risk of being physically injured by the violence, but there are long-term impacts on um, emotional trauma. Um, it can create psychiatric disorders and impact brain development. And it can also perpetuate a cycle where children learn that this is a, this is a normal behavior and, and then can go on to, to also repeat that abuse. And so it's really important for us when we're looking at a domestic violence response to also make sure that we're providing care to the kids who've witnessed that, that violence and that we're addressing the long-term impacts of, of the trauma that they've experienced. And that's something that we really focus on at Discovery House, but also across the whole continuum of care. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, it looks like we are running out of time, but I just wanted to thank all of you panelists for uh, such an incredibly informative and insightful discussion. I really enjoyed listening to all of you. Um, to everyone who has joined us, we will have a recording of the event available to all of those who either couldn't make it or would like to revisit the discussion. Um, and if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to email us at comms at discoveryhouse.ca. That's C-O-M-M-S at discoveryhouse.ca. Um, and I also noted that there were some questions that were submitted in the chat that we were not able to get to. So we will try and reach out to those people as well to answer your questions and connect with you afterwards. So this concludes today's webinar. Thank you for attending and thank you for joining us panelists. I hope um, all those attending learned something new and I certainly have. Um, and we hope that you enjoyed the event. Uh, have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.